part of uh, today's proceedings, the annual statutory meeting. And I'm really pleased uh, to begin this uh, by announcing that we're going to make um, our most distinguished award this evening. The Royal Medal of the Royal Society uh, of Edinburgh is its most distinguished award. And th today, this is going to Professor Richard Morris. You're going to hear more about him from the uh, from Anna Dominicek, Professor Anna Dominicek, who is going to actually read out the citation. Anna. Thank you. The President, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Richard Morris is an internationally recognized neuroscientist who has made several highly original contributions to the study of neurobiology of memory. He has developed areas of research that raise the possibility of developing treatments to stem the glo global epidemic of dementia and cognitive decline. Richard Morris began his education at school in Washington, D.C. before moving to England. He studied the natural sciences at the University of Cambridge before completing a DPhil in the Laboratory of Experimental Psychology at the University of Sussex. Following a two-year period when he worked first for the British Museum and then the BBC as a researcher in science and features, Richard Morris moved to Scotland to take up a lecturing post at the University of St Andrews. In 1987, he was promoted to reader at the University of Edinburgh, where he developed the Center for Neuroscience. He is the founder and first co-director of Edinburgh Neuroscience. Richard Morris is a pioneer in the development of spatial memory tests, and his water maze paradigm, or Morris maze, uh, for studying spatial learning is now globally used as the test of choice for assessment of mammalian memory. His discovery of the requirement for N-methyl D-aspartate receptor involvement in the development of spatial learning was fundamental to the field and led to the development of the synaptic plasticity and memory hypothesis, which is now recognized as the best account of how memories are initiated. His work has laid the foundations for the global effort into elucidating the mechanisms of memory processing and subsequent development of treatments for memory loss in dementia. Professor Morris ha has worked tirelessly as an ambassador for Scottish and British neuroscience, contributing to numerous advisory and strategy groups, both nationally and internationally, including a period seconded as Head of Neuroscience and Mental Health at the Wellcome Trust. He is also passionate about the public understanding of science and has supported efforts to encourage and inspire young people to take an interest and pursue careers in science. Richard Morris was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1994 and the Royal Society in 1997. He was a founding Fellow of the Academy of Medical Science in 1998 and was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005. He received the Zotterman Medal of the Swedish Physiological Society in 1999, the British Neuroscience Award for Outstanding Achievement in Neuroscience in 2002, and the European Journal of Neuroscience Award for Achievement in Neuroscience in 2004. He was created a commander of the British Empire in 2007, for services to science. It is for his outstanding contribution to the field of neuroscience through his pioneering work on the identification of the synaptic basis of learning and memory in the mammalian brain, which has raised the possibility of treatments to stem the global epidemic of dementia and cognitive decline that Professor Richard Morris is awarded the Royal Society of Edinburgh Royal Medal. Uh, Richard wants to say a few words, um, I think, about some of the people he's worked with. 
I'm absolutely delighted to receive this award. I feel very humbled, but particularly delighted to do so amongst my fellow fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It's really uh, uh, terrific for me and my family, and I'm delighted that my daughter, eldest daughter Louise is here to be with me this evening. Um, I think the only thing I want to add is that the life scientific has its ups and downs, but um, one of the great privileges is the opportunity to work with lots of exciting young people. And um, I have to say that only yesterday I received an email from a group in the lab saying that they were desperate to share the latest results from an Excel spreadsheet with me of an experiment that hadn't been working for a long time but finally was showing signs of promise. And uh, so they're, they're desperate to see me as soon as I get back to work tomorrow. And I think that that's really what it's all about, uh, to pour over data and to think about what's happening in science is just really great. And um, I can tell you, they, they keep me young. Thank you very much. that you get lots of bits of paper. <laughs> the second part of this particular session is um, following on a tradition that the outgoing president um, should explain what they've done in the past in some way or another. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do that now. Um, and I'm going to speak about health, uh, past, present, and future and I think we probably need the, the, the lights down, and that's, that's good. Thank you very much. This, by the way, is the view from our front room in Larks. Um, spectacular place. This is where it all began for me. What I'm going to do, and the reason why I decided to do this was that um, in reflection, and some of the, sometimes these things only uh, become clear on reflection, um, uh, I've been involved, actually, in medical science and in health affairs, both uh, strategic and, um, and managerial, more or less, since I began my career. And this is where I began my career, in the old Materia Medica building uh, in Glasgow University, where at the time uh, when I decided, with the help of David McKenzie, who's here, one of my cousins, um, going through the booklet of what you might study at the University of Glasgow, encountered the creation of an, an entirely new course in what was then called biochemistry. It still is biochemistry, but it wasn't very well uh, known at that particular time in 1956. And so I became one of the first five students who studied biochemistry in the old Materia Medica building. My mentor, and who, the person who really set my career going, um, and he did so in a quite extraordinary way, because he was, he was uh, he's a Pole, um, um, Ivo Leminski, born in Krakow in Poland, um, a doctor in Poland, became involved in the war as a doctor serving in the troops, uh, made a, a remarkable escape from the Germans in Poland, and finished up in Glasgow, and was employed by the... Um, Glasgow Western Infirmary to manage the antibiotic program there. His wife, Inca, a remarkable woman, he didn't know where she was, she didn't know where he was. She made her escape through southern Europe, through Portugal, and eventually in a ship finished up in Glasgow. And these two people met um, not knowing what had happened to them during these intervening years and lived happily ever after. It's a remarkable story. But he um, had a, a very clear idea of what he wanted to do in relation to controlling microbial infections into the future. And he had also spent a, 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 a fairly long period of time uh, in the Pasteur Institute, and he had absorbed the teaching of the great people in that institute who introduced the vaccines against tetanus and botulism and he was a great believer in looking not just at antibiotic therapy, but also at the possibility of using vaccines. To cut a long story short, 
He needed a biochemist uh, who would be able to um, identify um, possible components of a vaccine against an organism called Staphylococcus aureus. This organism is ubiquitous. Um, probably about 30% of this audience will be carrying it in their nasal um, um, surfaces, which is a reassuring thing for you to know. Um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, very, very few of you will have ill effects, but it is carried, it lives on our skin, it lives in our nasal surfaces, as I've said, and most likely it doesn't cause any problems. But if it gains access um, to the interior part of the body, then we can be in real trouble. Now, at this time, uh, penicillin was still very effective. Although Evo had picked up that already, even in these very early days, at the beginning of the 1960s, there were a few strains of Staphylococcus aureus which were becoming resistant. And he thought ahead of this. He said, must we rely on antibiotics? Let's try another route. And as I said, that route, in his way of thinking, was to identify virulence factors which could then be used as antigens and which should then be the components of a vaccine. And that was my task, to add, at least to begin to purify and isolate some of the more important possible um, candidates. As I said, um, most people become carriers, 30% permanent carriers. The organism spreads uh, by contact or in the air and it con can cause widespread deep infections, and I'll show you in a moment. Um, the present threat, of course, is from MRSA, the methicillin-resistant organism, which is multiply resistant to many different antibiotics, and, as I've said, can have multiple resistance. And we now know that this organism, we didn't know at the time I started working on it, and I was involved in the discovery of some of these things, um, produces a, a number of toxins, a disturbing number of toxins. Some of them cause food poisoning. Um, one of them causes very uh, severe toxic shock syndrome. Uh, another one has a devastating effect on the skin of young children called sc scalded skin syndrome. And uh, the one that I began working with is one which, if it comes into contact with tissues, will kill the tissue around it, and that's known as necrosis. So potentially, and that's just the toxins produced by this organism. There are lots of other factors. This is potentially, and was a potentially, still is a big problem. And if we look at this more carefully, um, what happens is the organism is on the skin. And um, if it penetrates the skin, it can cause a localized infection, as you see on top left, um, or else it can spread. <coughs> and it can spread into the bloodstream, which is known as bacteremia, and then it can uh, locate in the bones, causing osteomyelitis or arthritis of the joints, um, pneumonia in the lungs, abscesses <coughs> in the muscle, um, endocarditis in the heart, which is very serious, and it can even get into the central nervous system, causing meningitis and cerebritis. I've mentioned that some of the noxious things produced by it are toxins, and these toxins, um, uh, mediate certain diseases. One of them is called the skin syndrome and the other is toxic shock syndrome. Um, so that's the organism and it is a major threat and um, there's, it's, it's still a, a great worry. I uh, purified the toxin and uh, we actually did formulate a vaccine which contained that particular toxin in an inactivated um, uh, form called a toxoid which was perfectly antigenic, when combined with some of the other antigens that we were working with, um, Evo's mixture actually did work. It protected animals against challenge with Staphylococcus. The problem then is that the diversity of this organism is such that that's not enough because there are so many different types of it. And the, the task it became theoretically impossible to provide all the antigens you would need for a, uni for a vaccine that would work across the board uh, in everybody's um, uh, body to protect them against that barrage of things that I've just described to you. But that didn't deter my interest in toxins. 
And I was greatly fortunate to receive an invitation uh, to go to New York to work for uh, Professor Alan Bernheimer, who was the leading world expert on these kinds of toxins, uh, and uh, spent a really, really happy and productive time in New York as with Eleanor and um, our first child. And we were uh, among the last people to go to the United States on the Queen Mary, which was great fun. Um, <laughs> During that time, we made what became really quite a significant um, discovery. On the bottom picture, you can see part of a red blood cell membrane, which is absolutely covered in small rings. What transpired when we f investigated this, and I did this in, co in collaboration with uh, John Freer in New York, who was an electron microscopist, and this picture was taken um, in 1967, which was pretty early days to begin to look at individual molecules. There are actually six molecules of the toxin forming each of these rings. And the ring doesn't just sit on top of the membrane. What has happened is it's actually punched a hole in the membrane and formed a pore. And these, this was the first discovery of pore-forming toxins because before this, nobody had any idea how cell damage and cell death was inflicted by these toxins. They were thought to be enzymes, but they're not enzymes. They're actually surface active proteins, which uh, polymerize and, for, and punch these holes in membranes. And we showed that they did exactly the same thing in artificial membranes. I'll talk at the very end of the, um, the talk about what that we're doing uh, on rather similar grounds at this moment in time, not with toxins and another different ap application, but nevertheless it's interesting. So that then became an important aspect of the work that I became involved with. Um, I went back to Scotland. Uh, we set up um, an institute uh, under EVO um, uh, on the Garskib estate, which is about four miles from the central um, campus of Glasgow University. It was a highly successful um, department. We developed um, specialisms and we developed very, very highly trained postdocs and PhD students uh, on a number of different virulence factors in different bacteria, or from different bacteria. I then had a great feeling that I wanted to get closer to what was happening in the clinic in hospitals. It was great fun to do this work in the lab, and, and it was, you know, we, we published lots of material on that, and it was very successful. But an opportunity came to go to work in the Royal Infirmary, uh, in the Diagnostic uh, Microbiology Department in the Royal Infirmary, as uh, an honorary consultant and senior lecturer in the department. And I did that, um, and, and stayed there for some years. And that was a, a tremendous experience because in that department you were dealing with infections that were affecting patients every day, 24 hours a day. You had to really be on top of, your, of, the, of the, the job in order to do that job and that was part of the clinical work that I did. But on the side, we discovered two more really very significant toxins. I worked with uh, a very distinguished dermatologist called uh, Professor Alan Lyle. Um, and he had been working for a, many, a long time on a, thing, on a disease which became known by his name, Lyle's disease. And in this disease, um, young children in particular, um, occasionally, and these occurred in epidemics, not necessarily very large epidemics, but nevertheless clusters of cases, and he was currently investigating such a cluster of cases in quite young children in Glasgow. And he wanted to, came to me and said, John, do you think this is caused by one of your toxins? And I said, well, honestly, Alan, I've never seen anything like that uh, caused by any of the toxins that I work with, and I think it's unlikely. It's probably some kind of immune reaction. However, we, um, what we did was we kept the samples from the culture of these strains safely in the refrigerator. And then an, an American virologist using um, a neonatal mouse test um, showed that if you inject these neonatal mice with certain strains of 
staphylococci, they cause scalded skin syndrome in the mouse. Within about three days, we had defrosted our samples, injected them into neonatal mice, and completely replicated what had been done in the States. So almost by a stroke of luck, but by good management in the sense that we never gave up and got rid of our material, we had shown that this was a new staphylococcal toxin and we characterized it. Then I went to uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, we went there uh, in 1976, pretty troubled times in Ireland, I may say. But this is the, uh, the central square in, in the entrance to Trinity College, if you have been there. This is the Campanile, which was one of the Georgian buildings built um, by a succession of members of the royal family in, uh, in, in, in Britain, supporting at that time, um, a university, a college, which was rather similar to Oxford and Cambridge. And it has retained a really distinctive, fascinating, and quite amazing um, atmosphere to it. This is Front Square. My post there was to be professor of this institute called the Moyne Institute. Moyne Institute was built by uh, members of the Guinness family in, member of, in memory of the first Baron Moyne, who died, was killed, assassinated, in the Second World War in Egypt. And the Guinness family decided to commemorate their family member by building the institute that's since been extended considerably. But it was a, a pretty important place as far as Trinity College is concerned. And one of the features of this was that um, it, uh, when I went, before I went, it was uh, almost an institute of public health, which was fine. But um, what the college wanted to do was to unify the science end of the college with the medical end of the college, which was housed in a hospital elsewhere, where we could bring together science and medicine in relation to our knowledge about microorganisms and how they work. And that was the job that I had. And this for me, was a fantastic period in, our, in, in, in my uh, career. I was there um, for 13 years, Eleanor, uh, a little longer because she became um, a lecturer in physiology, uh, although her training was in chemistry, and she became a histologist, and um, we had just a marvelous time. Uh, there I built up uh, the, the, the pleasure of building up uh, a really fantastic team from all around the world, um, and we tackled many different problems of staphylococcal and other disease-infecting organisms. We were visited by, one day by uh, representatives of a company called Procter & Gamble, who came to my office, which was halfway along. Incidentally, if you were playing on this cricket pitch and you hit the cricket ball through my window, which is not impossible, um, then there was a, a distinct fine which I could impose on this student. <laughs> um, and I never did, and they didn't succeed. They tried quite hard, but they didn't succeed, <laughs> um, as students do. And uh, so, anyway, to cut a long story short, Procter & Gamble had run into a real serious problem. They were producing a new form of tampon. Um, highly absorbent and different in structure and different in the way in which it was applied. It was very, very popular among uh, young women, but there had been a number of very serious reactions to it and a growing number of young women who died of it. So they, went, they wanted to enrol representatives of the people in the world who knew most about the organism. And the organism, again, proved to be the Staphylococcus, because it's on the skin surface in all parts of the body. And it was being transmitted in these tampon materials. And what we showed, to cut again a long story short, um, and many people around the world at this stage were working on this, uh, was that there was a completely new toxin responsible for this particular disease. What uh, was fascinating was when you looked at the epidemiology, how, what was the pattern of the occurrence of this disease across the United States and elsewhere? 
It was in very highly developed, very clean areas. It didn't occur in the poor areas of cities. It occurred among good, clean people. Um, the reason was that these people had, had not the same exposure to staphylococci as, as normally you would get. And so they didn't have any antibodies to the organism, and they certainly didn't have any antibodies to the toxic shock syndrome toxin, which was why they succumbed. So the answer was, well, first of all, you had to redesign the tampon, which was done, and make it safe. Um, the second was that if you immunized and you knew that the person had uh, antibodies, then you would be resistant to the disease. So this was the kind of work that I was engaged in doing up until um, I returned to the UK to take up a post at the um, Queen, Queen's Medical Centre, which is a, a magnificent uh, medical school centre in Nottingham. This was my Swedish phase. Um, uh, during this time, many of the colleagues I had and many of the, um, those most interested in doing work on bacterial toxins actually came from Sweden and I spent quite a lot of time in the Karolinska Institute. Uh, and although it was impossible to have blonde hair because Elna refused to allow me to, to dye my hair blonde, um, <laughs> I, I tried to imitate being a Swede as much as I could. That was it. <laughs> um, Anyway, when I got it, almost within days of getting to Nottingham, um, another fascinating problem arose because the, the laboratory I now was in, and I was very serious about always wanting to be closer to the clinical side of things and, and to patients, was a, a big public health laboratory service which ran the whole of the public health laboratory service for most of the East Midlands. And... Um, Within a few days of getting back, um, we, had the, we had the outbreak of salmonella, um, which was attributed to the presence of salmonella in eggs. And you may remember that this was a, a, um, a rather um, serious statement which was made that um, most of the eggs in the United Kingdom were probably contaminated with salmonella. Margaret Thatcher, who was the uh, Prime Minister at that time, went berserk. <laughs> the Minister for Health lasted about three hours after that. Um, she immediately established um, a team to investigate the safety of the egg population and indeed the safety of the whole po poultry um, uh, population in the United Kingdom. And um, it was uh, headed by Mark Richmond, who at that time was um, the vice chancellor of a university, but also had been a tremendously distinguished uh, microbiologist, uh, whom I, I knew very well. And Mark appointed me to this committee. Margaret Thatcher gave us less than a year to investigate the safety, as far as Salmonella was concerned, of the whole food chain in the United Kingdom from the farm to fork and through the commercialization process and so on. This was a hugely demanding process, especially for me because I got landed with the, the microbiological safety of eggs and poultry, which was the most controversial bit of the whole, um, the whole study. Um, we, I won't bother you with the details, but it was a very intensive um, period of time um, what came out of that was a control system for the breeding of um, egg-laying populations of um, poultry, which actually has largely got rid of this as a problem. And one of the surprising things, there are lots of things that were obvious, that some of the food stuff was contaminated, uh, some of the farm processes were not adequate, some of the handling of the, the, the poultry wasn't adequate, but the real thing was that we were importing grandparent strains of poultry, which is what you do. You have to start with grandparents, then you get uh, parents, and then you go down to the, the breeding uh, poultry uh, flocks, and then you go into egg production with their offspring. These grandparent uh, 
poultry were being brought in from uh, Northern Europe, from Sweden, and they themselves were contaminated with, staph with, with um, salmonella. And the salmonella were being uh, transported or transferred by vertical transmission through the egg-laying system into the breeding stock, so that as well as having poor hygiene associated with part of this problem, one of the issues was, for goodness sake, we must get the breeding program straightened out. And that was the end product of that particular study. So, well, incidentally, in doing so, one of the things I did when I went as head of uh, microbiology, and again as an honorary clinical person um, in Nottingham, was to have a weekly meeting. But you could only contribute to the weekly meeting if you had something really interesting to say. And one day somebody shot, put their hand up and said, Prof, do you know that the most uh, cases of salmonella that we see nowadays are in bodybuilders? I said, no, I wasn't aware of this problem. <laughs> and the, um, the investigation then showed that these bodybuilders were eating about 15 or 20 raw eggs a day. <laughs> and so you can understand why they got salmonella. Um, so, and then we had the, the great Stilton cheese problem, which was one Christmas, and there was, this was broadcast widely on BBC, that Stilton cheese um, produced somewhere in East Midlands, very close to us, uh, was apparently causing um, several cases of food poisoning um, in, across Britain because it was being exported and transported um, quite widely. Uh, what, we what we found was that a local cheesemaker uh, for Stilton cheese had a worker who stirred the, um, the cheese mix at the beginning with his bare arm and he was a persistent carrier of Staph aureus. <laughs> And so he was infecting the entire cheese production of this output. <laughs> um, and en I didn't mention one of the other toxins, but th that th the staphylococcal enterotoxin is an absolutely ghastly thing. I won't go into the symptoms, but... Um, <laughs> so we had to somehow get rid of this chart. Um, <laughs> but then the law dictated that the contaminated cheese had to go somewhere safe. And the only place it could come to be safely stored was in to our huge block of refrigerators in the hospital. And <laughs> so the hospital then became a resource of thoroughly contaminated cheese, <laughs> which smelt for weeks. Anyway, <laughs> um, seriously, uh, the next stage of my interest in relation to um, the health service in general was when I was uh, phoned um, from one of the heads of one of the local authorities in the, the west of Scotland, in the Glasgow area, in the, in the um, sorry, that's another story. This, this Fair Shares for All, which this went before the story I was about to tell you. Um, Fair Shares for All started um, with a, a, a purely accidental meeting bumping into uh, the Minister for Health at that stage called Sam Gilbraith, who sadly recently died. Sam was a tremendous uh, Minister for Health. He was the Minister for Health just before the Scottish Parliament was formed. And he spoke to me one evening at a, a social event and said, John, you know, uh, the way in which the health service is funded is not to my liking. It isn't actually fundamentally fair. So he said, I would like you to chair um, a panel, an investigation, into how fair it is and what changes should be made if any changes were necessary. And this became the basis of this report. I won't go into all the detail of it, but what was set up was one of the biggest um, information gathering uh, events or um, studies um, in Scotland at that time. It was a massive um, study, and what we did, what we found was what what I undertook to do first of all was that whatever amount of money we had, whether it was 
500 million pounds or 500 pounds that we could spend on health in Scotland, the 500 or 500 million should be spent in a manner which was fair to all the citizens of Scotland. For instance, if somebody collapses and breaks a leg in uh, Sucky Hall Street, they're surrounded by Glasgow hospitals and lots of uh, medical support. If somebody falls down on a mountainside in Mull, um, looking after his sheep, that may not be the case. But there should be every possibility that these two identical accidents get fair treatment in the health service. And without um, going into too much uh, detail, what came out of this was a new resource allocation formula for the health service in Scotland. Um, we looked at the elements of the population share that was being given and what might be given. We looked at adjustments for age and sex structures within different populations. We looked at adjustments um, uh, for morbidity and life circumstances because of the great differences in social circumstances that exist across Scotland. And we looked at this issue that I had first struck on, which was remoteness. Should we be allocating more to remote areas so that they can deliver the same level of service as those in non-remote areas? These were the main kind of categories that I was looking at. And we were looking not just um, at health in general, but we really had cat categorised almost every different kind of health problem by these four uh, criteria. And then we built up an index which was based on an extensive analysis undertaken to identify key indicators, um, unemployment, elderly, on income support, mortality rates in people less than 65, households with multiple deprivation, and these indicators were combined into what became known as the Arbuthnot Index. And indeed, the, the, the thing is still called the Arbuthnot Formula. Um, of which I'm really quite proud. <laughs> um, so that uh, was presented as a report, very substantial report, to the entirely new Scottish Parliament. It was the first major report that went to the, the Scottish Parliament in 2000 when it was formed. The first uh, Minister for Health took the report. We had a, a very long series of investigations and we were quizzed by the then new Health Committee in the Parliament and the report was accepted and the formulation was changed and um, was applied over a period of years to achieve what came close to equity. So that was another experience. On the side of this, um, in 2006, or perhaps as a consequence of this, um, the Scottish Parliament had been in existence, obviously. Um, things were not entirely straightforward because the voting system was quite complex. Um, and there was a big pressure being brought by the, 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 the government in West, by, the, by the institution of Westminster, not just the government, um, that there were rather too many MSPs of Scottish, in the Scottish Parliament, bearing in mind the 72 Scottish MPs that were uh, representing Scotland in Westminster Parliament. And this became quite a big political issue. And Alistair Darling suddenly appeared in my office in uh, Greater Glasgow Health Board at the time and asked whether I would be prepared to chair um, a group who would investigate what was happening and what might be done about it. Because if we didn't do something about it, it was quite likely that the 129 MSPs would be reduced in number. And this was right a, a very big political issue. So what we, we set out to do was to look at the boundaries. Perhaps we might have to redraw the boundaries if we're going to reduce the number of uh, MPs in, um, the, in, in the Westminster Parliament and maintain the same number of MSPs in Scotland. Um, we certainly had to look at the voting system because it was, um, uh, it was a, 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 a system that was not the same as um, a single transferable vote, which we looked at very thoroughly in Ireland. It was a bit of a variation of that. And also, 
we were at that time then being represented in Scotland by MPs in our area, by MSPs in our area of two different types, um, two different types of MSPs. We were also uh, having European elections and we were also having local elections. So the question was, who the heck represents my interests in the world I live in? If I have a planning problem or a farming area problem or a health problem, who do I go to? So this had to be clarified and was done through this report, which was called Putting Citizens First. Um, so that was a, a kind of diversion from health, but occupied me for about 18 months. One of the members of this group was uh, one Michael Russell, who at that time was not a, uh, in politics. He was a writer um, and a reporter from the newspapers and actually was one of the brightest members of my committee, I have to say. <laughs> right. um, so that was the, that was the uh, putting citizens first. Now, now we come to the Clyde Valley. Uh, one Christmas, um, we're in our second home, which is in, in uh, the East Midlands in a small town called Bingham, I was shopping uh, in the supermarket and I got a phone call from the head of um, Greater Glasgow um, Council saying that uh, this was um, just as the banking crisis was really breaking. In other words, it was the 19, uh, 2010, 2011 period, sorry, 2008, 2009 period when the banking crisis really broke and the, the impending effect on public services was clear and leaders of councils were very, very nervous about how they would be expected to react to this. And what I was told was that the eight leaders of the Clyde Valley group of um, local authorities had agreed together to carry out a review of how they might work better together and how they might use their resources better together and get better value out of it, because as sure as anything, they were going to be expected to do that anyway, and they had to have a pretty good story uh, to go on. So I was set up as the head of this, as a chair of it. It was, again, an extremely exciting and very well-organized process. Um, we had a very short time, less than a year to report, and what happened was the following. I'll try and keep this simple. Um, this triangle shows how money is spent in the collect... In, in, you know, we pulled together all the data which we had pulled together from all the local authorities. And at the top of this is the, the proportion of spend that's for all the strategic things you want to do in education, in public health, um, in working with the health services and all the rest of it. That's 55% of the spend went that way. In the middle, you have the infrastructure and support service um, costs, which were 35%. And then at the bottom was the much maligned so-called back office effect. I hate this term, as if there's some back office somewhere in a, a huge hospital where um, you know, people just spend uh, 10 to 15% of the money. This bottom triangle is actually the operational support that makes... It's the information system, it's the communication system, it's the interlinking between different divisions in the health service and in local authorities, which is absolutely essential. So it's much maligned. But that's the proportion of spend that came out. And when you uh, then looked at what this meant, you could see what these proportions of money were being spent on in different, in different um, services. So on the top end, you're, all the social care the public health, working with the health service, um, personalization of, the, of what happens in local authorities, the education services were all within that. In the middle section, asset management and all these things that have to go on in an area for it to work, in roads, transport and all the rest of it, waste disposal, and in the bottom, uh, the support services, information systems that I've mentioned, advice services, uh, at the end of a telephone, the finance and HR and the purchasing commissioning bid. 
Interestingly, I was later asked to look to do this for the universities of England, not of Scotland, but of England. And um, the proportions of spend came out almost identical, obviously in different things, but the three areas, the three layers, were almost identical proportions. So I think this is probably um, a common feature of how these organisations have to spend their money. The end result of this was to try and get them, the local authorities to work more together in getting better value for all of these things, and a number of projects did work, but politics being politics, um, uh, it was pretty limited in the end the extent to which the collaboration, uh, or if you like, the sharing of services worked initially. Now the pressure on sharing services is even greater, and I think we're going to see a great deal more of it, and you certainly have many more conferences and meetings going on around Scotland on this topic. The last part of uh, what I'm going to say is about um, where we are currently with the health service. I should say that in the interim between that report and what I did here, um, as chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, um, first of all, it was an enormous task for, uh, over a period of five years, um, but it was absolutely fascinating um, in the sense that we... We had, to we had to reconfigure the way in which we delivered acute care across Glasgow because the hospital system was quite old established. It didn't really meet the requirements for the, 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 the current usage and the current degree of expertise that one needs to run emergency services. And therefore it was pretty obvious that some rationalisation was going to have to take place and some of these... Um, hospitals are going to have to uh, be reconfigured or in fact disappear altogether and new ones would have to be put in their place which did different things. And um, currently the last of these changes is now taking place with the completion of the South Glasgow Hospital which is a truly magnificent hospital and the, probably the best acute hospital to be built in the United Kingdom in recent years. And it, it just began, the planning had just been approved when I moved on from being chair, but currently I'm delighted to say that that is going ahead and going very well. So all of that happened. In addition to that, we had a huge controversy about the maternity hospital situation in Glasgow, and we had to actually close the Queen Mother's Hospital, which was one of the most difficult things I've ever done and I think caused me more loss of sleep than I've ever had in the rest of my life, actually. Um, it wasn't at all amusing. It had to be done. In the end, I was called to uh, headquarters in Edinburgh and I fully expected to be sacked on this matter. And it, actually what happened was that the Minister for Health lost his job and I retained my job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this had a happy ending <laughs> for me. Um, anyway, I, I kind of, the last thing I want to say is how are we, how are we prepared for what's going to happen uh, in the future in the health service? How are we going to achieve this integration which um, is really necessary between um, health and social care. And this is a topic that's been discussed for, for many years now, and I played a small role in this through chairing an advisory committee prior to the 2011 general election. Um, as it happened, reforming legislation was enacted in 2014, um, after that general election, which does set out a statutory requirement for the integration of health and social care services and places a, um, a duty on localities to do so. And the question is, how do we actually achieve this? And it's a big change that we have to, to make, but it's not so much a big change in, um, in what happens in health, because we've been doing this for, for a very long period of time. We have excellent services in acute care, really, really excellent services. And we don't want to change that. And we, we have growing, improving services 
in localities in terms of public health and in terms of care for people in the community. But we have a huge challenge because the, 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 the proportion of people who are becoming older and requiring more care, there's a bit of a misconception here, which you, you get to somewhere about my age and then you deteriorate and somebody has to look after you. It's not exactly like that. People get ill, they get better. For some period, they've got to be in hospital. They come out, they get better. The whole thing depends on us being able to achieve the right relationship between people who can, do, can deliver this level of care at the appropriate level in the community if possible. If you can do that, and in the best communities in Scotland, 98% of people are treated within their community or within their home. 90% average, 98% average. In the worst performing communities, it's just 91%. Now that may not seem to you as a big difference, but if you fill that difference by people being in hospital who aren't particularly being benefited from that and placing a huge strain on the facilities that the hospital should be providing, then we have a problem. And it's very expensive. So I don't believe, I don't, not saying that this is an easy thing to do, but we now have a statutory requirement. We have a duty placed on localities to sort this out. And really what we have to do is to bring together the, the groups of people who look after social and health care in communities, and there's a lot of different ones, and enable these people to have trust in what they're doing and confidence that in the level of care that's being provided. Build on the excellence of our hospitals and of our GP service, extend the GP service if we possibly can. So you bring the edge of the care system closer to the centre of care. And that um, is where I want to end. Thanks very much. And I'm, I'm now, um, I've got to ask the speaker to answer questions now. <laughs> so quite happy to answer a few questions if you have them. Who would like to start? You don't have to ask questions, actually. <laughs> Maybe you just have to think about it. Yes, sorry. I'll shout my lady to Can you, the, with the costs of health care, which yes. are always being debated, there's always a lot of uh, talk about the costs of medicines, the costs of duplication of effort and so on. Nobody talks about manpower. Yes. And it's my experience of 40 years of the National Health Service that manpower planning is pretty awful. Do you have any comments on how we could do a better job there? Because it must involve about two thirds of the cost of running health care services. Oh, it does, yes. Um, Why don't we get it better? Well, there are people in this room who have been spending, not, not, I wouldn't say 40 years, but just spending quite a lot of time in doing the same things um, as you have been doing, and I did some of that myself. I, I think the, the NHS has made, and, and I think when you talk about manpower, manpower, you're not just talking about manpower in the health service, you're talking about manpower as it affects everyone who's delivering care. And that's got to do with people achieving the right degree of professionalism and qualifications, the right degree of training, the right degree of training uh, in progress with time, in other words, updating people because treatments and approaches to how you do things in this complex world need to be updated. And I'm, I'm sure we don't do that as well as we can, but absolutely certain that these things are in the minds of the managers who are responsible for it. Um, I. I'm not sure that I agree with you that the problem is in the, the manpower manager. I think the problem really is in the relationships between the different groups of manpower. If the different groups of manpower have confidence in the team, and what we're talking about here are teams that have to be built up in localities and teams that have to be built up in, in hospitals. And it's pretty notorious that you know, surgeons um, are not, keep themselves to themselves and paediatricians do the same thing and cancer 
um, experts do the same thing. So we're not best placed at the present time to have this cross-fertilisation. I think that's probably more at the heart of the issues that you're raising than just the numbers. The numbers is always a challenge because the, the money is going to get even tighter. Yes. Thank you. Can I carry on? Uh, my name is John Gillis. I'm chair of the Royal College of GPs in Scotland. And it's carrying on from your, um, thank you, from, your, your, from where you finished, uh, Sir John. Um, and one of the things is that we have this demographic shift. We have lots of complex, multimorbid uh, individuals whom we didn't have 20 years ago, and we want to look after more of them at home or in a homely setting, as the government document says. Uh, at the same time, we've seen a decline in the percentage spend in general practice yes. uh, over the last 10 years. Now, I've been a GP for over 30 years, and one of the things that I've never seen is a transfer of resources from hospital to general practice and primary care as the, as the workload has risen. And I wondered what your feelings were of, the, of how we might do that, because that will have to happen if we wish to get everyone up to the 98% uh, of elderly patients looked after at home, which is possible. Mm. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have specified at the beginning that these should be easy questions. <laughs> um, the, uh, yes, you, you've, you've, you posed a very serious point. And um, the, the way in which this has to be done is, I think I've been stressing, maybe not clearly enough, but um, the, the professional services that we now have are not bad. The question is, are they... Are they in the right place? Are the, are the right people doing the right things? And where, how does the money flow in order to support that? And you're asking about how the money flows. And you're asking about money flowing from one area to another. I think probably the biggest advance that we've made in this, and you, you will be aware of it, is the integrated resource framework. We now know across Scotland, in every area of Scotland, how the service monies are actually spent, how many people are seen, what their ages are, how long they've been in hospital and then back out, how they're being cared for. In their, we've got all this data and we know how the money is being spent. So if you use integrated resource framework to their maximum capability, you should be able to then be much more secure in how that money is spent and the effectiveness of it. Because not just the question that we spend lots of money, some of it not being very effective at all. Um, you know, some of the things we have to do, because you can't just leave these patients untreated, you have to do it. You have to spend the money to do it, but it's not necessarily the best way of spending the money. So all of that has to be gone into. And um, I think really quite quickly, because I think my own belief is that in 2016, we're going to see a further pressure on the amount of money coming into the public sector in general. In which case, if, if we're by then not geared up to spend as efficiently as we possibly can, then we're in trouble. Equally, if you're running um, big hospital complexes, um, you know, you're doing what you're asked to do. You've got the trained doctors. You see these patients. You've got to actually treat them. You've got to have the money. So this is not an easy problem. And politically, it's sensitive. And politically, ministers tend to back away from when they've got to make difficult decisions. But we now do have very specifically, we now have specifically the information we need in order to tackle that. Okay? Yes? Uh, I would like to just bring together both the early part of your talk, yes. in which you've given some very a very interesting insight into how in the last 50 years there's been an, in, an exponential rate of development of research and uh, treatments and so on. But the shadow side to that perhaps is increasingly within medical care uh, that allowing someone to die is, is a failure. And I would like to tie that to the latter point about the future of care. Yes. And I wonder, could you comment that when Margot MacDonald's bill on, de on decriminalising assisted suicide yeah. becomes law, how that fits in with the future of care. Yes. <laughs> so 
have. I've modified the remit to answer only quite difficult questions. <laughs> uh, now, you, you've, you've touched on the, the, the whole issue of um, the end of life uh, process is, is, is obviously one that is going to have to be under the microscope in the next five to ten years. There is no single easy answer to your question because it's a moral issue, it's, um, it's a personal issue, it's a, a, you have an issue of the responsibility of those who are looking after people to look after them to the absolute nth degree to the best they possibly can. And that's what people do. Um, there are more and more cases of people who find themselves in a situation where they think they would prefer to end it because this is an appropriate place to end it. I don't think we yet have a way of incorporating that into the general way of doing things. But I wouldn't be surprised in the next 10 to 15 years if that did not emerge as in a, in a, in a, in a clearer way. But there's a, it's a very sensitive area. And, it's, and we've heard of stories where people have been very ill and recovered. And people who um, you know, have thought they're going to die and don't die. So this issue of, you know, this is the time I want to die, is so it's, it's one of the biggest issues morally and ethically that I can think of. Sorry not to be able to answer the question. <laughs> At the moment, I'm seriously thinking this is the time to do it. <laughs> anyway, my programme says that at 7 o'clock I've got to end. <laughs> so, so I'm going to end. I was going to add something else because at the moment I'm still involved in science. And I don't have time to go into the slides that I was going to show about it. But we're working on very, very interesting... I uh, work in a, a small startup pharmaceutical company called Lamella Biomedical, where we have actually um, got a mimetic, as that is an imitation of a, something which is deficient, and it's deficient in diseases that affect the lungs, for instance, in cystic fibrosis, uh, in the throat in, and in the mouth for people who've been irradiated uh, for cancer, <laughs> and for people who's eyes, the, the, the lubrication of their eyes, the tears just don't get made. We think we've got a replacement material which substitutes for that and um, we're about to go into clinical trials for that in the next year or so and it's very exciting. So it's still actually involved in science and the link between that statement and the very beginning is exactly the same phospholipid molecules are used in that process as were used in the artificial membranes we made to test the effect of toxins. Thanks very much. <laughs> so the very last thing for me to do now is to uh, introduce and hand over to my successor, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and I'm going to ask Jocelyn to come up. I'm going to take off my insignia. <laughs> I'm going to present it to Jocelyn. Jocelyn is one of the UK's most distinguished scientists. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> Jocelyn is an astrophysicist, is different from microbiology. Um, she, from the very time she took, in a, a way similar to me, from the time, at the very beginning of her career, when she was doing her PhD, she made observations which changed the world of astrophysics in that she discovered um, things called pulsars, a new phenomenon in the astrosphere, um, and her boss got a, um, a Nobel Prize for it, but it was her <laughs> observation. Um, and since then, um, Jocelyn has done many different things. She's at it, not least worked in the Royal Observatory here in Edinburgh for a number of years. Um, she is well known across the world. 
She delivers lectures on that topic, but also on many other topics across the world. She has uh, been a great advocate for the participation of women in science and in mathematics. Um, she helped the Royal Society of Edinburgh to produce a very informative and influential report on that topic. She's been an advocate in all sorts of venues in doing that. She's an incredibly pleasant person and she will make an excellent president and I offer her my heartiest congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sir John, and thank you also, visitors and fellows. I follow in the footsteps of a man who stands tall, in several senses of the word. <laughs> you should see the size of the furniture in the President's office. <laughs> Sir John will be a hard act to follow, because under his presidency, in the run-up to the referendum, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has positioned itself fantastically as a neutral place, as a source of expertise, and as a place concerned with the future of Scotland. Although the referendum is over, maybe the game is only starting. And I hope that the Royal Society of Edinburgh can continue to position itself as an authoritative but non-partisan acad academy. Sir John will be a hard act to follow, but there is one great reassurance in all this. I've chaired many bodies, but the RSE Council, I think, is the one with the greatest amount of clout, experience and sound information of all the bodies I have chaired. It's going to be great fun chairing it and I shall be relying on council and the other officers very heavily, but I'm sure it will be very interesting. Thank you all. <laughs>